All right, well, it's 7.01, so why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome everybody to our webinar. Um, my name is Jamie Erickson. I'm the director and curator for the Hermosa Beach Museum. I have with me tonight, Mark Shoemaker. He's on our board of directors in Hermosa, as well as the board of directors in Manhattan Beach. So the reason we're all here tonight is um, I came across a small envelope of photos mm. and it was in a great little bag in an acid-free box hiding in our archive and I opened it up and there were just these a series of fantastic photos that were all taken of the same date in the um, tile factory that was started by T.C. Prouty in Hermosa Beach. Um, photos of kind of documenting almost the process of tile making, which Mark is going to kind of go into. And you're going to see those photos. And what's really cool is Mark has actually colorized a lot of them. So kind of be able to see them from a different perspective. So I reached out to Mark and showed them to him. And uh, Mark kind of, not kind of, you actually really took off and have done some amazing research on this. And so this is kind of, this webinar is really the deep dive into Hermosa Tile, Metlock Signs, T.C. Prouty, what an amazing man. Um, we've actually been able to connect with some of his relatives, which has been really fun, some of whom are in the webinar tonight. So a special welcome to you guys. Thank you for being here and for participating in this. Um, what a fantastic guy. I wish we could have met him in person at some point. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and let Mark get started because he has a lot of content and I want him to be able to get through it. But please do make sure that you come to our exhibit opening where you can actually see this vintage tile in person on Friday next week at six o'clock. Just swing by, grab a glass of wine and check it out. It should be really fun. Um, and because of Mark, we've actually been able to collect tile that was manufactured by the company through the different owners after TC Prouty sold the company. Um, so you'll be able to see all of those stamps on the back of the tile. We also have some objects on loan from some of our pre one of our previous presidents of the Historical Society, Regina Taylor. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys can come out for that as well. And in the meantime, um, go ahead and take it away, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you all for attending. Um, yeah, it's been a lot of fun doing this research. It was really fun meeting some of uh the main principles, TC Prouty's relatives, they help with a lot of information. Um, so when when we saw the when I saw the photos and I knew about you know Hermosa Tile, but I didn't really know how it all evolved, I became interested and started doing research. And um yeah, it became apparent that this guy was a, you know a genius and he really started the first major economy that provided a lot of jobs in Hermosa Beach. And then you'll see later on, he left Hermosa and went to Manhattan Beach. And he started the first major economy in uh, the city of Manhattan Beach that lasted until the late 80s. So let's see what's going on. OK, so. Tonight, I'm going to talk about Theodore Chester Prouty, um, his early patents and inventions, uh, how he evolved into Prouty line products that made what we call Hermosa Tile, what ended up happening with the Prouty line products tile company, um, and the house that they built on the strand in Hermosa that still stands, and also how he established, his family established Metlocks in Manhattan Beach, which I'm going to cover the early origin of Metlocks, which involves neon signs. So this is uh, Theodore Chester Prouty. Uh, I think he looks like a very determined young man here. He was born in 1870 in Traverse City, Michigan. I'm guessing this photo is probably when he was in his late teens or early 20s. So we're going to talk out about his abilities in mechanical design. Um, he invented a thing called door hangers uh, that were used on like barn doors and parlor doors, what we call pocket doors. Um, he got his first patent when he was only 21 years old. And he started a company in Midland, Michigan to make these different types of uh, door mechanisms. 
1894, he married Jenny Lane Sterrett. And in 1897, uh, their son Willis Oswald was born. Um, the business grew. They built a new factory in Midland, Michigan. And then in 1901, they uh, moved to Albion, Michigan. But there's a few pictures of the different types of door hangers that he used that would go inside houses and inside barns and buildings. They're collector's items now. Um, here's some that were taken off. I think must have been a big door. Um, the ones in the in the color pictures. Uh, there's also he came up with a locking mechanism, a hasp in the bottom right hand corner. And this is a blow up view of what that hasp looks like. I I've tried to figure out how this would work. Um, I don't know anything about locksmithing. It looks very complicated to me. I don't think I could design that, but um, evidently it was, it was popular for him and uh, used in a lot of locations. He then, uh, in 1903, their son, Kenneth Andrew was born. Um, and in 1905, he assigned his door hanger patents to a company called Wilcox Manufacturing. The family moved to Aurora, Illinois. He worked at Wilcox as a secretary uh, but he was uh, still involved with his T.C. Prouty company. And then in 1910, Wilcox merged to become Richard, Richards Wilcox, and they continued to make all the different types of door hangers that Theodore Prouty had uh, patented. So here's a picture of the family in 1910. Willis on the left, Jenny, his wife, T.C., uh, and his son, uh, Kenneth, on the right. So he went from mechanical design to what I call micro-mechanical design. And he started doing speed and mileage indicators in Elgin, Elgin Illinois. Um, he filed patents for odometers, speedometers, and tachometers. This is a time when automobile manufacturing was taking off as well as airplane manufacturing. Um, he assigned his patents to a company called Van Sicklin, and um, they made devices for automobiles. And then Van Sicklin contracted with Elgin National Watch Company for five years. And during that time, Theodore and his son Willis were working at Elgin Watch and living in Kane, Illinois during World War I. And he also started experimenting with altimeters for aircraft. So here's a picture of a brochure of a Van Sicklin altimeter based on a, based on a license for, for, from a patent that T.C. Prouty had. Um, this was World War I. He got a comp the company got a contract for 10,000 tachometers at that time, the U.S. was building about 12,000 aircraft a year during World War I, but World War I ended, and that contract ended, and he decided to take a change in his direction and um, do other things. So this is what I call the materials and process design phase of his life. Um, the family moved in 1919 to Los Angeles to make electrical supplies. Uh, their first place they landed was in Hermosa Beach at 4116th Street. I think the family was just taking some time off to enjoy the surf and the sand. I think they came out here fairly wealthy um, and they could kind of plot the rest of their lives, you know, by relaxing and uh, enjoying California sunshine. So in, uh, in May 1919, they bought a house at 549 South Wilton, which is near Hollywood. And Kenneth attended Los Angeles High School, which is one of the oldest high schools in LA. Um, and Theodore began experimenting with talc from various parts of the state. And uh, he found out that talc obtained from Death Valley was superior to clay in, in making uh, different objects. So he patented um, the some designs for ceramic or electrical installation insulation material, and also the processes to produce ceramic products. Here's a copy of one of his early patent filings from 1920. You can see under the red lines, he had an idea of making, of using talc and ceramics as insulators for electricity. Down further, it talks about applications such as possibly spark plugs, uh, so he didn't really know where he was going with this, but he knew that he had something that he could uh, make insulators out of talc. And um, in 1921, he 
organized a California corporation called Prouty Line Products that was going to use ceramics for electrical insulation um, and decided to open a factory in Hermosa Beach. It's, a, it's across from the community center on Pier Avenue where Vons is now. Um, in 1923, he patented a process and equipment for tile production. He made a thing called a kiln car that could carry ceramic product through a patented tunnel kiln, which allowed, um, let's say, the, the, the material that needed to be dried to go through this tunnel kiln at a consistent speed and temperature. And this guaranteed consistent high quality. And those processes are still used to this day. Um, so he started construction work on the, uh, the Pryline products. And the intent was to manufacture electrical supplies. This is a 1924 tile. Um, I don't know if this was done abstractly like this, or if this was a uh, something happened during the process, but it looks pretty cool. But it's uh, it's one of the earliest Prouty line pieces of tile that we know of. Now I'm going to go into the factory. This is at the factory on July 11th, 1925. These are the photos that Jamie talked about. So TC's up there in the upper left corner. Uh, Stella, who is Willis's Prouty, who's kneeling on the on the ground. And behind him is Ken Prouty, the youngest son, six years younger than Willis. This is T.C. Prouty's office. Um, I think we think maybe some of this furniture still is in the hands of the Pretty family. Uh, the Pretties are the great, great granddaughters of T.C. Prouty. Um, this was the tool room in the factory. These were all black and white photos that I colorized. Um, this is what they call a powder mix room, where you make what's called the bisque. And the bisque is what the, is the base material for what forms the product you're making. And they started pressing tiles from this bisque. So if you see this um, round wheel up in the top here, in the center, that probably would have been turned to press the tiles down into the shapes that they, the, they, they were in the molds. Here's a bunch of stacks of press tiles. And these tiles were destined to what TC Prouty had patented as a tunnel kiln. So you take those press tiles, you run them through that, uh, you put them on a kiln car and you run them through that oven and um, at, a, at various temperatures for heating, you know, cooling down, very controlled process to guarantee quality. Um, these are the tunnel kilns. Um, right here on the left, you can see the opening of one. On the far right, you can see one. On the bottom right corner, you can see one here. Um, these are ladies that are doing what's called chamfering. They're putting bevels on the edges of the tile. Um, here's women doing, putting glaze onto tiles. This is called a dipping machine. I don't know exactly how it works, but I think somehow this wheel and this device here on the table is putting some kind of a pattern on the tile. Um, these are putting, uh, decorating and, and glazing freeze strips, which are like border tile. And again, now you're gonna go through a second firing through that tunnel kiln and this time with the glaze on the tile, the, the, the kiln car goes through the tunnel again and the glaze gets its color, opacity and finish. Then when they come out, the tile gets packed and gets ready to go to shipping. And then here's some pictures from the, uh, the family, uh, from their album that shows uh, in February, 1925, a shipment ready for uh, shipping at the top. And another one that says there was 54 crates of tile. That's a five ton shipment. That's a big shipment, I think, of tile, five tons. Um, in 1926, 
the American Encaustic Tile Company out of Zaneville, Ohio, purchased the Prouty Line Products Company. And they enlarged the capacity there 10, 10 times its size. They now ran five tunnel kilns. And during this period, they trademarked the name Hermosa. Um, 1928 was a very prosperous year. They had about 200 employees working. And American Encaustic Tile Company with the Hermosa operation and some others was the largest tile company in the USA. They made about 25% of the total USA tile production. So here's um, pictures of um, the tile factory, the original tile factory on the left and some new buildings being built on the right. Um, on the bottom left where that says Camino Real, that's Sepulveda Boulevard. Uh, about where the sign on the left says uh, tile factory, that's where Pier Avenue is. Often the cloudy or foggy distance is the Surf and Sand Club that we call the Biltmore Hotel. That was in January. Here's the same view in June. You can see the Biltmore back there on the horizon, on, right on the beach. You can see the buildings here along Camino Real are more finished. So it was a pretty big operation going on. Now this is the, um, this is the west side of the factory looking towards the east. And what you can see here uh, running along the, the foreground of both of these pictures is the old Santa Fe railway tracks. So when he had those five ton shipments of tile to move out of Hermosa, he was right next to a train track to move the product. This was a kind of an interesting find out of the family album showing when American and Caustic bought the tile company um, and some other pictures inside the tile factory. So this is some product. Um, what I did here was I took pictures, the top row, the top four pieces are Prouty Line uh, made tiles. And the backside, you can kind of make out the word Prouty Line, Prouty Line, Prouty Line. And then the bottom three tiles, are um, trademarked AETCO with Hermosa on them because they were the they were the AETCO was who trademarked the name Hermosa that wasn't used on the Prouty line tiles, but you can see it's the same molds, just with the different names of the company now. Here's some other early tiles. Up here you can see this was a um, a Prouty line tile, and um, those same, that same glaze, I would say, and colors were used by AETCO. On this one down here in the bottom right, you can see the patent numbers, different old tiles have patent numbers. If you look those patent numbers up, they all relate back to TC Prouty. Here's some other more colorful design, AETCO Hermosa tile made in Hermosa Beach. Um, here's some other pieces made with the Hermosa trademark on them from AETCO. Any trade, any, any tile that has AETCO Hermosa on it was made in Hermosa Beach. Here's a picture that I randomly found on the internet of um, workers at the American Encaustic Tile Company in 1929. Um, I think there's probably getting close to like 150 to 175 people working at that time. I don't know if any of these guys went surfing in the morning. Some of them might have gone surfing on the weekend, but the, I imagine the majority of them lived in Hermosa or close by. Then what happened was we got the depression and AETCO began to find a began to have, finan have financial difficulties. I found a couple little artifacts in our uh, records room. This, the one from 1930 is from a telephone directory. Um, and the other one from 1931 is saying, Hermosa only has one major industry, AETCO, manufacturing high-grade building, bath and ornamental tile. So exclusive and high-grade in its type and quality that it finds a market all over the United States. 
So here's an American encaustic tiling company uh, brochure from 1932. I know this is an eye chart, um, but this presentation will be online afterwards. So if you want to try and dig into this and read some of this, I welcome you to do that. Um, on the right hand side, sure enough, these are buildings that have Hermosa tile in them and they go back to New York and places in between. So here's a, here's a part of that same uh, American encaustic um, brochure showing all the different types of color glazes that this tile came in. Then in 1933, Gladie McBean out of Lincoln, California, purchased the AETCO West Coast operation along with the Hermosa trademark. Uh, tile manufacturing continued in Hermosa Beach and Gladie McBean took advantage of some of the um, patents and they started to manufacture a product called Malonite dinnerware up in Glendale. Um, they were able to use the, the tunnel kiln designs from Prouty to do a single fire glazing process. And this was a, a, a really good way to save time and expense of a tour fire process and ensured consistency and quality. So those design, those patents now weren't just being used for tile, they were being used for to make dinnerware up in Glendale. Now this is a Gladding McBean um, catalog from 1934. You can see that on the bottom left there, that they're using, they're, they're, they're giving credit to American Encaustic Tile Company. And in the middle, they're showing, they're giving a patent notice saying that these patents are being used by Gladney McBean. They were originally uh, Prouty patents. And um, this limited Gladney McBean to using these patents and licenses to only in the, in the Western USA and a couple other places. But they primarily, um, American Encaustic protected their, their patents and license by limiting Gladney McBean to sale only on the Western part of the US. So here's some Gladney McBean tiles that we found. Um, you really can't for sure date these tiles. Um, they're using the Hermosa trademark. They're giving credit to the original patents, but you don't know really where the, when or where they were made. Um, here's an old box of Gladney McBean Hermosa tile. Um, I, try, I reached out to this person to try and see what date those newspapers were, but I couldn't find out. So again, I don't know if this is Gladney McBean made in Hermosa or Gladney McBean made elsewhere. Um, I don't know who this character is, but uh, the picture is are from a Leo Creo ranch house. And uh, the records show that these tiles were Gladney McBean tiles made in Hermosa Beach. Kind of an interesting bathtub on the right side there. Um, then we reached the end of tile manufacturing in Hermosa Beach. In 1935, Frank Philo, who is the VP at Hermosa Tile Factory since 1922, he left Gladney McBean and started General Mosaic Tile Company in El Segundo, which ran from 1935 to 1972. I, I grew up in El Segundo. I remember the old factory there and, and now it's part of Rec Park in El Segundo. Um, in 1937, Hermosa Tile moved to, Gl to Gladney McBean's Glendale plant, and no more tile was being made, and no more tile has been made in Hermosa since. But Gladney McBean kept that Hermosa trademark going. Here's an ad from 1954 talking about micro sized Hermosa tile, an ad from 1956 talking about using Hermosa tile in kitchen designs. And these are kind of cool little uh, salesman samples boxes that Gladney McBean salesmen could take out on the road with them um, to show the different glaze colors. And those are little tiles that are only about um, maybe one and a half inch by one and a half inch. The trademark expired in, in 1988. So that was kind of the end of the Hermosa tile era. Now, you ask, what, what, what did T.C. Prouty do after he sold his uh, factory to American Encaustic in 1926? 
he became an architect and he designed the house that still stands at 1602 The Strand. Um, they wanted a Beverly Hills style Spanish colonial home and he designed it. And a guy named McCready built it. And I've been inside it and it's kind of like a little tile museum in there. It's a beautiful home. Here's construction photos from the family album showing them starting putting to put up the foundation on the house right on the strand in Hermosa Beach. In fact, I don't even think the strand is there in front of them. Uh, this is 1926. Maybe it was a boardwalk at that time. I'm really not sure, but I don't really see a strand picture there. Um, there is some cement on the bottom right. So maybe later on they added, when the house got finished, they added more uh, sidewalk around their house. This is the front door to the house. Um, those are what you call little gun sight windows on the left and right of the doorway. There's one for looking from the inside out, uh, a nice door with a lion door knocker. This is the fireplace in the living room. It was a little cluttered up when I took pictures, but you're seeing glazes there and designs there that are very rare. You'll probably never see those glazes or designs anywhere else. This is part of the kitchen. These are all tiles that would have been made um, in Hermosa. There's downstairs bathroom. If you remember back to when I compared the Prouty line to the ATCO, CO tiles, you'll see that same pattern with a different glaze color here. Um, this is a stairwell going upstairs with stained glass windows. That's looking up this beautiful stairwell to the ceiling, more stained glass windows up on top. This is the upstairs bathroom. The shower in the upstairs bathroom. And this is the um, outside patio up on the top floor. Um, it's kind of a round room inside as it looks as from the outside. And this is the view they had from that patio looking south to PV and out to Catalina on a clear day. So along with building that house in 1926, he and his sons ventured off into electrical sign design. In 1927, um, T.C. Prouty purchased four acres in Manhattan Beach where the Metlox Plaza is now. And Metlox was opened as a division of Prouty Line Products. They had the first electrically welded steel structure on the West Coast. And the main product was to be outdoor signs where they were gonna mount uh, neon tubes on top of ceramic letters. So that's a groundbreaking picture there. And that's the first Manhattan Beach City Hall behind them. Here's some other groundbreaking pictures uh, from the uh, Prouty family album and some different uh, time periods there with the development of the factory, the Metlox factory at 1200 Morningside Drive. Um, this would be looking south. So Morningside Drive is running north-south um, towards the end of Morningside Drive out here is where Manhattan Beach Boulevard is. Manhattan Beach Boulevard would be going up the hill. So the center of the picture in the background, that would be what we call today's hill section. And this whole area in the foreground is where the Metlox Plaza is. This is a view, another view looking west. And again, he had the foresight to build his factory near the rail line and actually built a spur that went into Metlox. So as his factory grew, he'd have way to ship product. Again, the Manhattan Beach City Hall in the background. I didn't really know this until like someone brought this to my attention, but there was actually some Metlox tile made, um, but I don't think there's very much out there. I think it's pretty rare. I think they were still doing some experimenting as they went into this new laboratory factory environment in Manhattan Beach. Um, the mold pattern on these tiles isn't the same as the mold pattern 
on the Prouty line and the American Encaustic tile and the Gladian McBean tile. So these are new molds that were done for the Metlox factory, the Metlox location. So in um, 1927, Willis, Theodore Chester's son, uh, filed patents for um, a tubular lighting element on a reflective ceramic body. So that one on the left is uh, a neon sign where you're basically using one tube of neon to light up the whole sign. It's all connected together. Um, and then in 1930, on the right, he filed these patents so you could have individual letters um, that would have had to have been charged electrically from behind. Here you can see on the bottom. Um, so you could have individual neon letters made out of ceramic. Here's some of the early um, ceramic signs. There was also signs like this in El Segundo, a couple, and down in Hermosa. I haven't been able to find those pictures yet, but I've read that there were. Um, I think the one on the left, down by the pier, is an unlit sign. And I think this one on the right uh, looks to me like it would have been a neon lit sign. That's Sepulveda Boulevard going off in the horizon with that water tower being about where um, between 8th and 6th Street, that was the original water tower for Manhattan Beach. And this is a blow up. So to me, it looks like that was a neon lit sign. They use distributors for their Metlock signage. This is at a company called Calco. This building is still in existence at 123 South La Brea in Los Angeles. Unfortunately, this whole beautiful facade of all this design and tile and art deco style has been plastered over. So shame on them, but the building still stands. Here's um, a Metlock on the bottom. You can see a Metlock signs truck and workers installing a Metlock's neon sign on the Ward Heater Company. Here's a little uh, drive-through grocery that has a, a neon sign in the upper left. And then in um, 1930, uh, Willis again, Theodore's son, he patented uh, designs for theater marquees. Um, and using these uh, individual ceramic letters with, that were neon lit. And here's, here's a, um, a design patent for, that he filed in 1931 for the structure. Because you can imagine these ceramic letters when you're spelling out the name of a hit movie would have gotten pretty heavy. So you had to have a structure design to both charge the neon, hold the letters, and stay structurally sound on the on the front of a building. Um, the first major movie theater that used these designs was the Pantages. And uh, I, I highlighted some of the features from this uh, ad where the signage, the, the mounting structure was made out of cast aluminum. They had these flashing luminous tubes that were unusually bright. Um, the interchangeable Metlock ceramic letters were finished in glazed black and overlaid with pure gold leaf. So when that thing flashed at night or during the day, it was, I'm sure, very impressive. And here's a colorized version of what that would have looked like. The 1930s Pantages in Hollywood with all those letters neon lit, um, as well as the tall vertical sign being neon lit. Um, this is the 1930 Warner Brothers in, in Huntington Park. We're in, you know, that's another classic Art Deco structure. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of that one at night, but I think it would have looked as uh, similar to what you saw with the Pantages. Here's the Warner Brothers uh, down in San Pedro. That Art Deco building is still, theater is still standing and being used down in San Pedro. Um, a little bit of a night view there on the left and a daytime picture on the right. This is our Hermosa Beach Theater that we had that started out in 1923 called the Metropolitan. It morphed its names over time until it closed 
It was also called the Bijou and the Cove. On the left-hand side, um, when it started out as the Metropolitan, those signs were incandescent bulb lit. Um, I don't know the sign. I think the lettering was probably just uh, unlit, unlit letters that were mounted on the signage, mounted on the marquee. Um, but then later on in 1938, these views show um, the theater with its uh, neon lit letters and neon lit marquee. Unfortunately, all that's gone. So in 1931, T.C. Prouty died from an appendicitis. Um, he was a consummate inventor. He established the first major businesses in Hermosa Mahan Beach, which were driving forces for the early economy. His wife, Jenny, lived at 1602 The Strand until she passed in 1937. And now, as you saw, the house is still a showcase on The Strand. Um, depression woes set in. So from 31 to 36, the demand for neon signs diminished. I'm pretty sure they were probably very expensive um, to put onto those movie theaters and the money just wasn't there to continue on with the sign business. So in 1932, uh, under Willis's uh, direction, Metlock started making California pottery, uh, this, this clay dinnerware or, or probably somewhat talc-based dinnerware. Um, and he became, he began producing three lines. The most popular became po Poppy Trail. So that's the end of the story. I wanna give special thanks to some people that helped uh, find Tile Forest, Marcus Russo Hidalgo, if you're on, thank you. And James Bishop from the Franciscan Archives, Joe Taylor from the Tile Heritage Foundation, Diana Mauser from Native Tile and the Pretty Sisters for helping with those family albums. And this story is gonna, it's not gonna stop here. We're gonna continue on with the Manhattan Beach Historical Society, continue on, continuing on with the story of Metlocks. Wow, are that was any, fantastic. Are there any questions? Oh yeah, if anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and put them in the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, and thank you so much to the pretties for being here as well as I think most of the people that you listed that um, in thanks are actually all here as well, which is really exciting. So I can't believe this guy. I, I mean, I don't know what you were doing at 21 years of age, Mark, but um, I certainly was not filing a patent with the U S government. No. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's quite a remarkable. He definitely had a, a level of ambition that I can't imagine was matched by many. No. And, uh, and, there were there's many more patents uh, credited to him. I think he had about seventy patents at all, and I think I only showed a, you know, a few. So he did he was he did things with hydraulics, um, phonographs. I mean, he he just kind of dabbled into a lot of different stuff. I think you have the story of of his church writing, Jamie. Yeah, you know, I think it was a story that um, Kenneth, because the, the photos that we found that kind of inspired this were actually given to Pat Gazin um, by, I think it was, it was Kenneth, correct? Probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah Kenneth, by Kenneth. Kenneth. Kenneth did the whole chronology of the Yeah, family. and I think he must have given them to her when she was working on her book. And um, I, so I think the story she wrote in there, she probably got from him, but um, he described his dad as... Um, just he would he was known in the town to sit in church on a Sunday during the sermon and kind of just like out in the open, unabashed, just be constantly scribbling down ideas. He would wake in the night to write down ideas and then immediately try to put them into action and make them happen. So um, he was definitely somebody that was of that frame of mind um, and was just constantly uh, the wheels were constantly turning. So. Um, yeah. And to answer your question, the exhibit is actually going to be on display at the museum until mid-June, um, at which point it's we're going to turn over to Iron Man because they're having their 50th. But um, so the exhibit will be up through then. Um, one other thing that's been interesting uh, in this process, of I've, I've actually gotten some emails from individuals that said their grandmothers worked at the factory. I think one of them is on here now. Um, so I'm wondering if it was during the um, AETCO era, um, just because, like you said, they had so many employees at that time. 
Um, but I'm wondering if they might be able to pick through um, that one uh, large photo you had and then some of ours, because you do see quite a few of the faces of the ladies that were working there at the time. Yeah, you know, it was interesting because when I stumbled across those uh, photos of the employees, it was on a Facebook posting. That's where I do a, a lot of research. And um, they had the, they had a, the photo of the AETCO employees. And then they had another uh, similar size um, photo of um, the general tile company in El Segundo. So I'm kind of thinking that when um, the tile factory shut down in Hermosa, that some of those workers probably migrated over to the new general tile factory in El Segundo. They would they would have had homes here already and they wouldn't want to leave their homes. So they could just, you know, they had skills and jobs that they could do at the Hermosa tile factory. So they carried on in El Segundo and, and some people probably worked in Hermosa and the El Segundo factory. That, that factory shut down in 72. That's interesting. And I, I, you know, I'm an El Segundo kid too. I'm actually broadcasting from El Segundo right now, but um, I didn't know that Rec Park was a tile factory. Yeah. On the, on the east side there, kind of uh, between what would have been Sheldon and Penn, uh, there was a railroad track there also that had a spur to a tile factory. And, uh, mm. and so they would have had, uh, you know, a way to move tile out of that factory as well. I forgot the year when it was shut shut down, but um, it was like it was a, the building. I think was destroyed like in the mid seventies to expand Rec Park. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So, because Rec Park, if you're not from the area, is just kind of like the the gathering place for kids, and it has been for generations. So it's kind of an iconic spot. Um, actually, I have a question from John Miller. He asked the original electrical insulators from Hermosa Tile were like the large round electrical insulators like we see on electric poles? I don't know if they dabbled into that or not. Um, you know, I, I know I read things like um, anecdotally, you know, he even mentioned in his patent that he was considering spark plugs. He was considering ceramic brake shoes. So in his mind, he was probably thinking all sorts of stuff. But I think... Um, I think he was a businessman, you know, I think he understood what it took to run factories and to keep a factory running. So I think he focused on, you know, stuff that he thought would be unique that he'd be able to sell. And um, the tile process that he came up with was, you know, was pretty amazing. Absolutely. Um... Okay, and I have a comment here from Rick who said several of us in the 1960s that went to Miracosta worked at Metlocks and we, refer we were referred to as Met Hogs. It was very hot in there. The pay rate was $1.35 an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, that I can imagine that, it was well, hot. That, that explains a lot, Rick. <laughs> In fact, I was I was thinking when you started the presentation, all, that series of photos in Hermosa were taken in, in high July. And I was like, wow, they look like, um, I don't know, um, they don't look quite as uh, distressed as I would imagine the heat would make you in a tile factory in July. Um, yeah, well, you know, I think, again, you know, he was a, he, he, he was always thinking. So I'm sure when he designed that factory, the way he did the roofs, um, I know he was capturing sunlight. He had south facing windows. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't be surprised if he had big level oars for ventilation to capture the ocean breeze. So I would I hope so. And it was high ceiling. So I, I'm not sure how how hot the tile factory would have been. That's true. And I think about it now. Um you know, it's been almost a, almost a hundred years since those photos were taken. And I don't know what the weather patterns were like. Um, they probably were certainly different from they are not what they are now. So um, can't say what the temperature was on July 11th. So I, I can't, I can't talk to you, Lisa. I mean, I can't, uh, I can talk to you, Lisa, but you can't talk to me. But um, Lisa wanted to let us know that her mom, Kenneth, Kenneth uh, Prouty's wife is still alive at 86. And, oh my gosh, that's yeah. awesome! And then uh, Jennifer wanted to mention that um, Shaw bought Metlocks back. I think it was in 1946 after uh, World War II. We'll go into that on the next presentation as the um, 
as we go and you know cover the the later days of Metlocks. Yeah, no, definitely. So I mean, because Metlocks has a huge history and legacy in Manhattan Beach, so that'll be a really great follow up for this one. Um, okay. Diana wanted us to mention that a lot of the companies across the U.S. were trying to come up with a tile talc body, um, and she believes Proudy was the first to create a workable talc body, um, which would have been very impressive at the time. Yeah, and that, and I think that was the, um, you know, the, prior to having that talc body. I think tile companies were looking for clay and clay didn't provide the um, consistency of quality that talc provided. You know, when you press the talc bisque and you fire the talc bisque, you were going to get a pretty much consistent uh, output um, as compared to clays, which would tend to craze over time and crack uh, the talc. I mean, there's, houses all over the country that still have this tile in them from the 20s and 30s that look as new as they did when they were came out of the factory. Mm -hmm. This stuff just doesn't wear out. I mean, the glazes were amazing and the, the quality was so good that, you know, people still have old bathrooms and kitchens with this Hermosa tile in them. Yeah. And I think um, it's, uh, I've gotten a couple comments from people just that, um, you know, most of our conception of the 1920s is black and white photos. So when you see this colorful tile, um, it doesn't always kind of click in your head, but um, the tiles produced at that time were quite beautiful and elaborate. Um, the pinks and greens and blues were insanely popular. Um, yeah. So it's quite, it's quite fun to imagine people with that in their house, their kitchens and bathrooms. Yeah. They, it was, I guess I would say it was a, it was a modern design for the time. You know, we were in the Art Deco period. It was a clean, geometric, modern look. Um, but at the same time, we still had, you know, Malibu tile and Catalina tile and other Calif early California tile that was much more decorative that would have gone into your more traditional Spanish colonial homes. Um, so even though we had these this factory putting out what I would call modern tile for the time, there was also a very colorful decorative tile happening in California, in Southern California. Mm -hmm. And Diana said that the talc of the body at that time was actually far superior and stronger than the version today, which is why, like you said, you still see a lot of that tile lasting in some of those houses that haven't quite been, uh, that have survived the, the purge of old buildings in LA. Yeah. Um, Carol wanted to know uh, who lives in the Prouty house now. Um, renters. Uh, the, we've been in touch with the owner. We'd like to try and um, make it more accessible to like an event or something. But the owner is um, lives in R Rwanda, in a, involved with a charity. And um, so there's renters in the house right now. Yeah, and I think the current um, individual that's there is doing some a little bit of work on the house. Um, as you can imagine, you know, a 1920s house needs uh, some new plumbing, um, but their plan is not to change the design or any of the original elements in the home, just to keep her up and running. Yeah. So, because it is definitely quite a time capsule, and I'm sure that um, if you're one of the folks that does daily walks on the Strand, you've walked by it a million times and just kind of looked up and wondered. Yeah, it's 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 very impressive inside because um, Theodore designed things like built-in lighting, built-in shelving, um, and know, no wall was flat. Yeah, there was there were no corners. Yeah, it was all rounded on the inside. Yeah, and I think that um, somebody's also mentioned. Uh, Rick mentioned as well that um, Jordan Belfort lived there um, at one point in time. We know him as the the Wolf of Wall Street. Um, I think he was rent either he was renting that house or another house down there at some point in time. So it should be kind of interesting. So, um, Oh, and to answer your question on the strand, um, they put in, a, I think they put in a boardwalk, um, of like wooden planks around 1902, um, before the city was founded in 1907, but it kept washing out, um, in the storms, people would also rob pieces to start bonfires on the beach. Um, so I think in the teens um, through to 1926, they started changing out sections into concrete. So they may not have finished all of it um, by the time they were building that house, but they would have been in the process of changing out the strand into a concrete walkway. Yeah. 
So they might have opted to skip out on that section or maybe not build it if there wasn't a house there. Well, I just I just couldn't make out if, you know, looking to the west from the when they were starting to lay the foundation for the house, if there was any strand out there or not. It's hard to see. Was the lot originally like kind of terraced when they built on it? So it kind of is almost like sitting up a little bit from maybe where the boardwalk was. I don't know. Might have to take have to take a look at those pictures again. Okay. Um, any other questions out there? Yeah. Any other questions before we let you guys go to get a refill on your glass of wine? Well, thanks okay. for joining us. Um, I think it's an important part of our history and it will be accessible online for other people to enjoy. And, you know, if there was, if I went through anything too fast, you know, go back and take a look at it and click through at your leisure. Yeah, absolutely. And um, definitely come out to see the exhibit opening next Friday at six o'clock. Um, and the exhibit will again be on, will be up through middle of June. The recording of this webinar will be on our YouTube channel um, in the next couple of weeks. I usually email out the link on our follow-up newsletter as well as posting it on Instagram. So how do they, uh, how do they find that link? Or how do they find that website? Or um, it's just on YouTube. So if you put, go into YouTube and type Hermosa Beach Museum, our channel should come up and you should be able to see a roster of like a list of all of our webinars, um, our lectures at the museum that we've recorded. Um, we're doing our best to make sure that all of our new content that comes out is recorded and put online. Um, so you can check everything out there. Yeah, I, I, I think on YouTube, you could probably even search on Proudy or Proudy line or something, and maybe the title would come up in a search. Yeah, it, it definitely should. So um, there's, uh, yeah, it's uh, scary what you find, what you type in, what you can find when you type into YouTube. But um, yeah, so we'll see you at the exhibit opening. If you're not a member with the museum, please, please uh, think about joining so that you can help continue to support us, do this awesome work, making education accessible. And thank you again to the fantastic family that helped us out with these photos. Um, we're really excited to include them in this presentation. I want to make one more comment. Uh, Bill just yeah. said um, he loved the theater stuff. And um, I wanted to let you know, I would have dug into that a little more. Uh, but right now, the Manhattan Beach Historical Society is going through a, um, an archiving, kind of a curating and archiving process for preservation. And so the documents I wanted to dig into weren't accessible. So hopefully um, the next time we do the presentation on the, lady, the later years of Metlocks, I'll try and include some new stuff if I find it regarding theaters. Because I think there's probably more interesting signage out there, neon signage. And if anybody ever comes across any of those ceramic letters, let us know. But I, I don't think they're around anymore. I just I just don't know if any survived from those theater marquees. Yeah, but I kind of picture them falling down and yeah. uh, you know break or breaking up if you try to pull them off and they're old. Um. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, thanks again for everybody for for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much. Have a good night, everyone. And if you didn't get a question answered, um, feel free to email us at museum at gmail.com. All right. Thank you, Mark. Have a good night, everybody. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. I'm going to click end. I'll see ya. See ya.